Hi, I'm Stephen Canop. I have the privilege of being the president of Freedom in Jesus Prison Ministry in Lubbock, Texas. Actually, I live in level land, and it is flat in level land. And uh, But Lubbock is a great place. The, the South Plains is a great place. Super people up here. And uh, I've been out of prison in December of 2020. It'll be 10 years. And uh, God has been so good to me. I just want to share a little bit of my background and my testimony with you. But mainly I want to share a little bit of teaching that I've uh, felt that the Holy Spirit wanted me to emphasize. You know, we really miss coming into the prisons in person right now. Uh, it's during this little COVID crisis thing. Obviously, you all know it's hardest, really, I think, on you guys and, and ladies, uh, even than it is out here in the free world. Uh, but just know that we love you and we care about you and we really miss coming in in person because before the uh, before the lockdown, we were going into prisons every week and multiple times, uh, seven or eight times during a week, we'd be inside a prison or a jail or a rehab facility. And uh, so we've had to shift uh, a lot of what we've been doing. And so we decided to do more uh, DVD testimonies, DVD preaching, and maybe some of you have seen the services we might have already sent into your facility. But you men and women that are locked up, we just know that we're praying for you. We love you guys and we miss you. Now, uh, when I got out of prison, I went to prison in 2008. I didn't have a long sentence to do. I just had uh, uh, six years to, to take care of and and uh, I was actually able to discharge that in a, a little less than three years with good time and everything in, in Nashville, Tennessee at a CCA facility. Uh, 20 years before I went to prison though, I had an office on Park Avenue in, in New York City and at 51st and Park Avenue on the 27th floor of a high rise building at age 35, 36 years old. I was making a quarter of a million dollars a year as a CPA, a partner in a in the world's largest CPA firm at the time, I believe they still are, KPMG Pete Marwick, and uh, I had a trophy wife and infant son. Uh, by every standard of the world, I was on top of the world, uh, but inside I was lost and bored and searching and seeking and restless, and I had climbed to the top of the business world in a in a short amount of time. Later, I heard uh, Joyce Meyer say that sometimes you can uh, be climbing the ladder of success so hard and fast that when you get to the top, you realize that your ladder was leaning against the totally wrong building. And so that's really what happened to me. I got to the top and I was bored and restless and, so, and searching and seeking and empty. And I started getting into all kinds of uh, bad things in New York City, especially around uh, Times Square and uh, pornography got a big hook into me. Triple uh, X theaters to pass the time to uh, the Triple X theaters that I went into were full of evil. They were not fulfilling. And yet pornography got me deeper and deeper a hold on me. And I went further away. I really wasn't ever serving the Lord. I grew up in the Baptist church. And I went further and f further away from God in my search for meaning, in my search to fill the emptiness inside of me. And it was only later that I found out that Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit, is the, and, and, and God the Father are really the only way that I could ever feel the emptiness that I had inside me. I ended up leaving my wife and infant son. I kind of went through a midlife crisis, what the world would call a midlife crisis. I ended up being diagnosed as bipolar. I was on manic phase, manic highs a lot. And, and then uh, I felt like I was a failure for the first time in my life and I sunk into severe uh, depression, uh, manic depression and uh, suicidal depression. Uh, and I couldn't figure out how to get out of that and, and uh, just a long story short, I ended up being homeless, living on the streets in Nashville, Tennessee. For two and a half years, I lived in a tent on an undeveloped wooded hillside in 
South Nashville. For those of you that may be in that area or know Nashville, it'd be uh, Nolensville Road and Harding Place. And ended up going to prison just down the, about three miles down the street at the CCA facility. Uh, but it was in prison where I really began to realize that I wasn't doing such a great job running my own life. I, t I had told God when I, uh, when I graduated from high school, went to college, I'd been in the church. I went down to the front of the church, kind of got saved. I thought I got saved, uh, got baptized. But when I went to college, I turned my back on God. And for, the most, for most of the next 40 years, I really didn't have anything to do with God. People would ask me, maybe I'd say I was a Christian, but my life didn't reflect it in any way. My language sure didn't, sure did not reflect it in any way. My lifestyle was terrible, a sexual immorality of every kind. I ended up being addicted to crack cocaine and marijuana and alcohol, pornography in the worst way. So when I found myself in prison, I was just, I felt like I'd fallen really to the very bottom of, the, of a deep well or the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. And it was there uh, that I remembered that I had kind of told God in, when I went to college that, well, I got this, I can handle my own life. I, 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 you know, I don't need God. And so uh, look where I ended up. So I told, uh, when I got to the uh, Davidson County Jail, I, I loved to read, didn't have anything to read. Somebody said, get a, uh, send a memo to the chaplain, he'll give you something. Well, I got a little Gideon New Testament. And of course, having been raised in the church, I began to read that and remembered a lot of the things that I'd learned growing up. I was raised in a Christian family. I can't blame anything I did on my on my environment or my parents or anything else, it was all me. And uh, so I, um, when I got that little Gideon New Testament, and then many of you know in jail or prison, you people make fun of you for reading your Bible. And so I was kind of beginning to read that kind of as, as, as secretly as I could <laughs> uh, at night and things like that. But the Word began to get in me and I began to have hope again. And uh, that, that emptiness that I felt inside of me, I think was just a yearning for God to fulfill that. And so when I finally came to the end of myself and I realized that I could not uh, run my own life like I told God I could, I, I said, God, surely you can do a better job than I am of running my own life. Look where I ended up. And I felt in my spirit that God kind of nodded his head and said, okay, now I can work with you. Because we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to realize that of our own selves, we can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible. So with, that was a real change for me, a real turning for me. And it was in 2009, and I was almost 58 years old. My crime was solicitation of a minor. So I was in, in, in prison knowing that when I got out, I was going to be on the sex offender registry. So I can relate to many different kinds of people. Uh, addict, addicted to lots of different things, bipolar, suicidal depression, uh, sex offender registry, and uh, I thought everything was hopeless. I didn't think that God could do anything with my life. But I just decided that, I, Lord, I said, I'll just trust you one day at a time. And with all the effort and intensity it took for me to rise to the top of the business world, I told God, I said, listen, I, I, if you can do anything with my life, I thought everything was absolutely hopeless. If you can do anything with my life, I'll serve you with all of my heart for all of my days with the same level of intensity and focus that it took to rise to the top of the business world and then later to fall into the depths of depravity and perversion of every sort, sexual immorality of every kind. When I went into something, I went all the way. So I told God, I said, I'll serve you uh, with that kind of level of commitment and intensity if you can just do anything with my life. And I just sensed that I just needed to trust Him one day at a time and that I would make a commitment to get enrolled in some chaplaincy classes. I started checking out good books out of the library as opposed to, I love to read, I was reading westerns and mysteries and there's nothing in and of itself wrong with that. But I just decided if I was going to put things into me, I wanted to read things that I could learn more about God and more about Jesus, more about the Holy Spirit. So I began that. I began to go in chaplaincy classes. 
And uh, I also found out about these Bible correspondence courses. Some of you have done those. And uh, I love to learn. And I love to read. So I would write off for one Bible correspondence course and fill all that out, send that back, and then I'd start another one with maybe a different provider and do that one. By the time I did that one, got that one off, then another one was coming back. So I really, my time before I gave my heart to Jesus was just dragging by. But when I got active, and when I quit watching TV and I quit playing cards uh, and got active in chaplaincy classes and reading good books, studying the Bible, doing these lessons, my time began to fly by. I couldn't even believe how fast it seemed like it was going. Such a difference in night and day. And I encourage you, wherever you are, if you're not doing those kind of things, get involved putting good things into your mind, good things into your heart, keeping good things before your eyes and in your ears. One way I know that God's real is because I used to have a really, really foul mouth. I cussing uh, was bad. And I started cussing at an early age in Texas, and that was kind of an art form, <laughs> really. And, uh, but when I got saved, uh, I, used to, I used to have, you know, every other sentence was GD or MF or some other foul uh, cuss word coming out of, and it's peppered in my language. Didn't mean anything to me. I just say it. But right after I got saved, I didn't even have to think about that. I knew God was real because all of a sudden I didn't want to talk that way anymore. And it it hurt me to hear others talk that way, and that's real prevalent in prison. And it didn't make me mad at them. It just it it affected me by saying, I remember when I talked that way, and Lord, I'm sorry that I hurt you that way. And so I was I I would never project onto someone else that they shouldn't be talking that way. But when I heard others talk that way, it just reminded me that, Lord, thank you that you're taking that away from me. And uh, there's other ways that God will begin to change you a little at a time. The more you seek him with all your heart, he says, I will be found by you. One thing I had to do was humble myself while I was in prison and write to my two brothers and my sister to ask them to forgive me for the things that I had done uh, in my addiction and being homeless and on the streets. They didn't even know if I was still alive. And I wrote to them uh, just a short letter uh, asking them to forgive me. And uh, I told them where I was and why I was there. And uh, I just, uh, when, I, when I put those letters in the mail, because I had humbled myself and asked forgiveness, I felt such a weight begin to come off of me and uh, it wasn't long. I'd, I'd been there 10 months and I'd never gotten a letter. <laughs> no money on my books. No one knew where I was. It, no one cared. Uh, but about a week later, I got a letter back and I heard my name at mail call. That was the first time I'd ever heard that. What a great, what a great, hear, uh, what a great blessing that is to hear your name at mail call. Went and got the letter, went back to my bunk like you do and opened it up. And it was my brother Rick and he said, man, I'm so glad to hear from you that you're alive. And he said, I'm sorry for where you are. Uh, but he said, I'm not holding any, anything against you. You don't even have to ask me to forgive you. He said, I'm sorry for where you are and why you're there, but can I do anything to help you? And that so touched my heart that, that he would be so quick to just forgive and to ask what he could do to help me. My other brother, they didn't compare notes. They didn't talk. But within a couple of days, my other brother, I got another letter at mail call, heard my name, and, and he pretty much said the same thing. He said, he said, I'm not holding one thing against you. I'm sorry for where you are and for why you're there because I told him what my charge was. And uh, I didn't write a long letter uh, expounding on all my sins. I didn't think that was necessary. I don't think God requires us to do that, except with Him. We need to realize, we need to talk to Him about what we've done and, and, and get that covered under the blood. But my other brother said, uh, can I do anything to help you? And uh, when they showed me, when God showed me that if I would just humble myself and ask for forgiveness from the people that I had hurt, if, if you can't always do that because... Some of them you couldn't contact, and some of them might not even be a good idea to, to contact uh, legally. But it, when you can, to humble yourself and to be willing to first admit to God, you know what, Lord, I was wrong when I did those things, and I don't want to do those things anymore. 
Thank You that the blood of Jesus covers me. Thank You, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank You that Your Holy Spirit lives in me and is making me one day at a time into the person, uh, Father, that uh, would be more and more in the image of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I want to encourage each one of you right where you're at. Seek God with all your heart. The, the verse that first made so much difference to me, many of you have heard, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, where God Himself says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And He, and he says there that when, when I seek Him with all my heart, He says, I will be found by you. I just want to encourage each one of you men and women to do that with all your heart. Your time will fly by. The rest of your life will be so much more meaningful. It's so much more fun serving the Lord. Yes, you still go through trials and tribulations, but you got somebody to go through with. And uh, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And you won't believe all the ways that He will restore relationships and that He will put you in a position where the Holy Spirit can live through you and love others through you and maybe even teach others or, or uh, testify to other people. The Holy Spirit wants to live His life through you. And it's all available because of what Jesus did on the cross to bring us back into right relationship with our Heavenly Father. God bless you. We miss you and we love you. And thanks for listening.